Hello and welcome to Nursing Emergencies, Cardiac, and Pericarditis. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk about pericarditis. Pericarditis is an inflammation of the pericardium. The pericardium is the outermost layer of the heart. So here's a picture here of the myocardium, the endocardium. So it's separating out these different layers of the heart, as you see there. And then the pericardium is on the outside. So we have two, we have the visceral pericardium and we have the parietal pericardium. The parietal pericardium is the one that's on the outside and it is not very flexible. And between those two layers there, you see the pericardial cavity. What happens when we have pericarditis is that there will be inflammation in that pericardial space and fluid will start to build up. Unfortunately, if enough fluid builds up in that space, we can have a life-threatening concern called tamponade. So let's see what happens when the fluid starts to build up in pericarditis. So we have fluid around the heart, so these are numbered 1 to 5 here, so you can kind of follow through what happens physiologically with the heart. Fluid builds up around the heart and compresses the heart wall. The heart can't expand to be able to fill so we have inadequate filling. This is the same kind of thing that happens with diastolic heart failure. So you can see either condition is going to cause a decrease in cardiac output. Thirdly, up there at the top, number three, there's a backup into the systemic circulation. And then that causes decreased blood flow to the lungs and decreased cardiac output to the body. So the end result is going to be decreased cardiac output to the extent that the patient can develop shock and actually go into cardiac arrest. So what do we see with pericarditis, this inflammation of the, pericardia, the pericardium? We see fever, chills, an elevation in the white blood cell count. You may be able to hear a friction rub. A friction rub is a squeaky kind of noise that occurs because that fluid that's normally very thin and fluid-like in that pericardial space is now becoming thick. So think of pus. This is inflammatory fluid, so think of pus. And that's what's happening here. It's making it thick, and we're getting a little squeak as the heart is trying to beat, and that fluid is kind of catching and not having that nice lubrication that it normally does. Chest pain, obviously. EKG changes. Now be aware that these are going to be in every lead. Instead of if a patient's having a myocardial infarction, they'll be in certain leads based upon what part of the heart is involved. Echocardiogram is another way that we can take a look at the heart to be able to determine if the patient's got pericarditis. So our prompt action is going to be that we want to give the patient some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. This is inflammatory, right? So let's decrease the inflammation with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and steroids. So we're going to hit it from both sides here with uh, decreasing inflammation. Pain control is important. If the patient's having pain, they're going to have a physiologic response to pain, which is going to cause an increase in their heart rate, and then that's going to cause more inflammation because we get more rubbing of the heart against that inflammatory fluid. Critically, we want to be watching for tamponade. As the picture illustrates here, fluid is starting to fill a lot of that pericardial space and that could compress the heart enough that the patient is not able to maintain a cardiac output. So that brings us to cardiac tamponade and what that looks like. So now we have so much fluid around the heart compressing the heart that we don't have enough cardiac output in order to be able to maintain normal function. What we look for, this is kind of the classic triad of symptoms of cardiac tamponade, and that is Beck's triad, jugular venous distension, muffled heart sounds, and hypotension. So those three things. Now think about those three things together. Hypotension, jugular venous distension. Okay, well, that could very easily be heart failure, but we don't get muffled heart sounds with heart failure. Okay, so that's going to be kind of our big key here and our big red flag. Not every patient with tamponade has muffled heart sounds, but it is a pretty good classic sign. Dyspnea, tachycardia, chest pain, pulsus paradoxus. 
We've talked about Pulse's paradox this before. That's the situation where we have an increase in intrathoracic pressure. Now, in this case here, the pressure is actually just around the heart, not around the whole thorax, but just around the heart. And because we have pressure around the heart, it's not going to allow the heart to fill. Now, when that patient takes a breath in, Lungs get bigger, even more pressure on the heart, and that will cause the blood pressure to go down because there'll be less filling. As the patient exhales, the blood pressure starts to go back up again. Okay, so that's going to be very pronounced in a patient who has tamponade. Pulseless electrical activity is an end result that we hope uh, doesn't happen. And certainly we can take a look at the chest x-ray. That's usually our first indication that we're going to see fluid around the heart or an enlarged uh, pericardial area. Our prompt action then is, first of all, to increase oxygen supply. We need to get more oxygen to the body since the patient is being hypoperfused. Decrease the demand. So in any way that we can decrease the demand, and before we said treat the pain because we don't want that patient to have an increase in demand. Hemodynamics, so maintain our filling pressures. Using positive inotropes may be helpful to help that heart to beat harder and stronger. But ultimately, we need to get rid of that fluid. If that fluid is still there and still building, we're going to continue to have tamponade, and the tamponade's probably just going to get worse. So we do a pericardiocentesis, and that's what the picture's showing. They take a 16, 18-gauge needle here, fairly large needle, and we're going to stick it all the way into the pericardial sac. So obviously, this is something that your uh, physician is going to do, but we may need to uh, assist with this. We expect that we're going to see blood as we hit the ventricle. Now the fluid that comes out of that pericardial sac may be a darker looking color of blood or it may just be serous type fluid or maybe a pus looking kind of fluid but it's going to be a little different than that nice uh, arterial looking blood that we see in the ventricle. So let's compare what we're seeing here with pericarditis with some of the other cardiac problems that cause chest pain. So in acute coronary syndrome, we have crushing type chest pain. It's relieved by nitroglycerin and rest, radiates to the left arm, and the sign of doom obviously would be hypotension. In cardiogenic shock, there may not be any pain or any radiation, and a sign of doom would be bradycardia. Heart failure, again, sign of doom is is hypotension. In pericarditis now we've got that pleuritic chest pain. Pleuritic chest pain is sharp, localized, and worse on inspiration. Relief with sitting. So we sit the patient up and they have some relief. Probably not complete relief, but they're going to have some relief. They don't want to lay down because it hurts more. The patient who's having an acute coronary syndrome doesn't want to lay down because then they can't breathe. Radiating back to the scapula, the sign of doom is going to be shock, indicating the patient's developing tamponade. Tamponade, we have dull, diffuse kind of pain. There may not be other symptoms, and obviously the sign of doom is a loss of pulse. So our cardiac quick check, how can we check on what's going on with our patient's heart quickly to be able to find out if something's happening, especially if we don't have an EKG handy? Well, be looking for shortness of breath. Shortness of breath is a good sign that your patient's having a cardiac problem. Oftentimes, that'll be the first sign, especially if our patient has had cardiac problems for a long period of time. What happens is that there is enough of the additional perfusion, enough of that collateral circulation that occurs around the heart to be able to maintain enough perfusion that the patient kind of gets used to a decreased perfusion state. So they may not have pain. Uh, there may also be, the patient may be having a decreased level of consciousness or we may be treating them for pain. So those are all reasons why chest pain may not be your good classic sign we think it is. Secondly, shortness of breath is going to occur because we're going to have decreased perfusion. Look for palpitations. Look for decreases in our perfer peripheral perfusion. And then in our heart sounds, we're going to be listening for an S3. Okay, now you probably remember hearing about Kentucky and Tennessee, okay, to try and pick out your heart sounds. Well, what works better for me is listening for that heart sound that sounds like sloshing in. So it sounds like lub dub da, lub dub da, sloshing in. That's your S3 heart sound. 
S3 indicates that we have too much fluid coming to the heart. Now, in this situation with pericarditis, as the fluid is starting to back up and we're getting into a tamponade state, we could end up seeing, or hearing rather, an S3 heart sound. An S4 heart sound sounds like tlub-dub, tlub-dub. It's right before S1. Also, the pattern you might use is a stiff wall, a stiff wall. So it sounds like that kind of a pattern. That's from having the stiff walls that are caused in a myocardial infarction. So we get decreased compliance of the myocardium, and then that causes the walls to be stiff. So that's an S4. Those are some things you can look for that might be able to clue you in that the patient is having a cardiac problem, even if they're not having chest pain. Well, thanks for joining me for Nursing Emergencies Cardiac Pericarditis. Until next time, bye now.